Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. Welcome back to the program. This is Avery Kelly. Today, I am with Dr. Tom Mallinson and Eric Holmstrom. We are back in Norway running another austere emergency care course, which is a PFC course for civilians. And we've already discussed the AEC course a bit in the past podcast. Today, I've invited these two in to talk about the running of academic programs for austere environments. Tom, you can introduce yourself real quick, and then we'll give Eric a shot. Yeah, hi. So uh, my name's Tom Mallinson. I'm uh, one of the lecturers with the college, and in my day job, I'm a pre-hospital care doctor. Eric? Yeah, hi, I'm Eric Holmström. I'm from Norway, and I'm really happy to be here and have you guys on board. Uh, my background, I'm a flight paramedic. I retired from the military, been training for uh, SOCOM students and some other courses around the world. Um, what do you want to talk about first, Abrik? So, lads, we're running a course. So let's talk about the, the difficulties and the advantages of, of running uh, an AEC course, and specifically the challenges of running... A, a course in a in a different country. So we're following the Maltese guidelines because we're a, a degree granting institution from Malta, but yet we're doing this in Norway again, and we're finding interesting differences. So uh, Eric Holmstrom is the course coordinator for the AEC. Uh, so Eric, what kind of interesting things have we had to deal with so far this week? So, Eric, uh, to start with, the, one of the interesting things that you already mentioned is uh, running in different countries uh, with uh, different uh, participants from different nations. Uh, as you said, in Malta, we have certain, uh, certain legislation and procedures to follow, and in Norway, they are different from the Maltese and probably different from the UK uh, procedures and legality of uh, procedures. So the first thing for a course coordinator is to start to look into if you're moving course to another uh, country, you need to find out what are the possibilities and the no-goes in those countries. The second thing that I, I, I find that is a little bit challenging is that as long as you have a lot of different nations, they have a different background. So you have to mm, prep the course and you have to in, uh, investigate in how what is the background of the students you are having? What are their levels? Because EMT education and medical education is different from country to country. So you can have a EMT in, in Norway. Is that comparable to an EMT in the UK or in Germany? What are their background knowledge? So actually for me, starting with this was to find out what kind of background has each of the students in medical wise. So where we can put the education level for the two. So. As you probably know, AEC has two different uh, courses. There's in, in, uh, AEC Basic and AEC Advanced. So if there comes a student who is uh, EMT approved in Norway or he is a fire brigade uh, medic, what kind of background does he have? Where does he fit? Does he fit in the AEC Advanced or in the AEC Basic? That's, uh, that was one of the, the, one of the challenges. When we sorted out the legality, um, different procedures, and what we can do in Norway versus what we can do in Malta or other places, I think that the next step is to find the right equipment and make sure that all the lectures and all the, the educational material is uh, presented in the right way and in the right time slots. And time slots is one of the biggest, as you probably can concur with, is that when we are putting in a, in a class and we have allocated one hour, for example, for the hypothermia, terrific, uh, hypothermia. Yeah. and then we have students that's very eager and ask a lot of questions, it's easy to go over time. So one of the biggest problems or uh, challenges as a coordinator is to make sure that we try to keep in, mm. in, in the time. So my suggestion for everybody who's, who's uh, running courses uh, like the AEC or other courses is that always be prepared for having extra time at the end and I and I think especially on this course where we so this is a this is a really valuable course and one of the values in it is the broad church of candidates of participants so as much as we have didactic time where we are imparting information there's some really valuable knowledge to be gained 
from candidates bringing up their own experience or their own um, operational guidelines from wherever they are. Mm. And I think this course is unique in the challenge that because we have some expert participants or candidates, you there's it's difficult to balance what's more valuable. Is, is me teaching this material more valuable than listening to an expert in their field from another country sharing their experience? Yeah, and that's actually a good point, Tom, because at this course we have a doctor or two doctors. We have EMTs, we have nurses, we have paramedics, and we have volunteer Red Cross yeah. people. And the good thing is that when you start to, to teach something didactic and you put it out to the students and come up with examples, so you use the students as part-time teacher uh, yeah. because they're discussing uh, experience and you get different point of view because they're different level of education and different nations yeah. participating. You have to give right and left limits because if you have someone coming up doing some wazoo comments that is not evidence-based, you have to nip that in the bud yeah. quite quickly. But the, and then that brings up the interesting issue when you're running a course of how do you balance, we're teaching evidence-based medicine, which is what we in the college certainly aim for all the time, versus how do we discuss anecdotal evidence or best practice from experts. And certainly we're, we're very fortunate in having quite often special forces medics who are, are doing very established, very high quality medicine, but it's not evidence-based in the same manner because those people don't push out all their evidence on a monthly basis mm. for, for obvious reasons. But you've often got people who are experts, but it's not evidence-based in a true, it hasn't been peer-reviewed and published, but you have to balance, our, is what they're talking about a maverick idea? Or is it actually really well evidenced, good science, but they're keeping it, they're doing silo working so no one else really knows what they're doing? Mm, and point. I think as an educationalist, it's difficult to identify, is this valuable learning where we should have interdisciplinary learning? Or is this someone who's perhaps doing something a bit weird and a bit maverick that we don't want to disseminate? Like this morning, we did an exercise with hypothermia and they put two of the students into the water here in Norway and got them nice and, and chilled and then brought them out and immediately put them in bin bags, which I wasn't quite sure on that. And they they said it, it, it makes a difference and there's science behind it. And they are putting bin bags first and then they're putting uh, blankets after. Mm -hmm. and that's a new one for me. And the, it's because here we're, we're very spoiled in that we're working at a sea rescue center in Norway. So these guys are experts at water rescue. So we're in a very safe position where we can we can put course participants into the ocean and cool them down to a reasonable level of being a bit chilly, probably not clinical hypothermia. Whereas if I was running the similar course in Scotland, I would probably not be pushing participants into a loch and letting them cool down because I'm not a water rescue expert. So I think that's that's a huge value from this specific course location and added a lot to the course, but there's going to be a challenge of, of providing that same educational experience. You'd mm. have to provide something different elsewhere or think more in depth about risk assessment because these guys have already have all of those risk assessments in place because it's their bread and butter. Um, but from as an educationalist, it's, it's interesting to see what is normal for them and what for me would be pain writing all the um, risk assessments. Hmm. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the, the, the point that I started with, is that you have to, uh, if you're, you're moving a course from Malta to Norway, you need to know, you should probably have a, a local guy who is, yeah. is used to teaching, so you should at least cooperate with the local guys to get yeah. through all your practical exercises, like hypothermia. What are your regulations? What are you allowed to do here? And also the big debate that uh, that always comes up is uh, blood transfusion, which is uh, now uh, been pushing more and more for, uh, far forward. So uh, in in Norway also we don't do auto transfusion anymore, uh, basically. And this has been done a lot in Norway, and a lot of people has been a little bit concerned about that because in Malta we are not allowed to do that at all. And in Norway we use live IVs on every patient for training. Mm -hmm. And they also mm -hmm. inject uh, drugs, or not drugs, normal saline, of course, but labeled as drugs. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's totally legal in Norway. But I don't think that's legal in Malta. And no. I don't know about Scotland where yeah, you Yeah, we, we wouldn't be eager to do that in Scotland, which is a shame, probably, because if you're safe enough to do that in clinical practice, 
you should be safe enough to do it in a much more controlled environment of the classroom. Whether that classroom is a classroom or outside, it's still a classroom mm. environment. I, so I think that's challenging and and you could easily fall foul of local regulations if you continue to a normal practice and then went abroad where, where suddenly that was illegal. Or for example, I'm medical director on this course, but I'm not a doctor in Norway. So so we have a local doctor as well for simple things like we, we're taking blood spots for um, Elden, Elden cards for, yeah. for blood typing. And even though that's very basic, in this country, I'm not a doctor at all. So someone could argue why you taking blood samples and smearing them with bits of card in this country. You're not a doctor, you're not a paramedic in this country. So so I think you could easily fall foul of that if, if you're used to running up IVs on, on pretend patients. You, if you went to a country where that was very much illegal and frowned upon, you could fall foul of that as a, as a course mm. or a running uh, organization. One of, one of the things that I, I really uh, find very useful is that this course and I am we're starting to do, do more and more of that in the, in the other courses that we have is that we are trying to make the people contribute with their knowledge because there's a vast group of people there but also putting them into the training the practical scenarios this course is heavily on the practical not so much on the mm. didactic. This is not a dead by PowerPoint course. It's just a little information on the theoretical part and then we go out and we do the hands-on. And I think that the feedback that we had from the last course and I think the feedback that we'll have from this course is also that the more practical, the better the course. Yeah, I, from the, with the, your educational hat on, that's the big challenge of, you can provide pre-learning and you can see that someone's clicked through the pre-learning but how do you ensure that they've gained value from that and they're ready to launch into the practical learning? So, so that that's uh, what we're doing in in Coronum and also on Specialized Medical Standard, which is the, the, the founder of this course, is that they, we use the flipped classroom in a sort of way because they, all the students get uh, a couple of weeks before they attend the course, they get access to an e-learning platform. And in that e-learning platform, you put check on learning. So you can actually... Because a lot of people know that, okay, I have to do this course, I have to look through it, and you just flip through it, and you don't see if they really learn anything mm -hmm. or, or read anything that is in the course. So if you do a course that is a flipped classroom on the e-learning module, I strongly encourage everybody to use uh, check on learning questions from each lesson. Yeah. And then maybe a final exam, uh, not a fail, pass or fail exam, but just an exam to see that, hey, mm -hmm. you're actually being reading what we present for you. And I think because even when I'm a learner on courses, I, I have really mixed feelings about that pre-learning. Because on one hand, it's a good way of delivering chunks of information. And and it's no real difference to sitting in a classroom watching a lecture. But part of me is always a bit, feels a bit like I just have to click through these slides. And I, and I think that's difficult to make that pre-learning interesting and engaging rather than yeah. just a, a tick box exercise. I think that's a big challenge in setting up any any of that flipped classroom approach. So, so when I first uh, was familiar with for flipped classroom was uh, when I was working as an as a instructor at ISTC, the, the special training center in Germany. And we introduced that on the second year and that was the first day when you arrived, you got to the hours after lunch to read through the material for the next day. So you, you mm -hmm. put it actually into the, I know that this is not possible for yeah, a short yeah, course yeah. like this, but if you have a longer course, the flipped classroom actually works because then you can study it for after lunch until five o'clock or whenever yeah. your time is out. And then the next morning you just go because then the student has read it and they have questions and then you are quicker or better prepared for the theoretical lectures and then yeah. You do the same for the next day and the next day and then you also have the possibilities to take uh, let the student do that on the evening if that's in the in their schedule so you can do uh, you can you can go through the material that i already been through on the e-learning platform yeah. for a couple of hours and then you can do practical and then you can do the next day the student yeah. can do the e-learning we found that very very uh, efficient on our istc courses i guess so in my mind, that links into the the dilemma of, in terms of the learning resources you want alongside any course, how far do you want to lean into creating a course manual for every course you offer? So for, for Quorum, for the college, we have a pocketbook 
which is our go-to guide that we utilize across multiple courses because it because it, it contains so much information but how do you balance having specific information for each course because you could write a whole textbook on prolonged field care or, or we could have printed out all of the clinical practice guidelines and bound them and given a copy to every candidate is there any benefit in that one benefit is they can read along to each lecture but the downside is that has to be updated from an educationalist point of view it has to be current updated and in a way then you're giving clinical practice guidelines to someone in a different country where they they might not be their clinical practice guidelines hmm. and and we're trying to walk that line by having a pocket guide in quorum that, that covers bullet points and and tips and aid memoirs yeah you, you have some valid points there because the, the, the pr protocol and procedures to teach those, as I said previous, is, is it's hard when you have a lot of national, uh, international students. For example, one of, the, one of the first thing we had to discuss was, are we going for March or are we going for CABC? Yeah, I, I think there's so, many, there's so many small differences, aren't there? And, and I think you, there are small differences if you're quite familiar switching between them. But if you only ever use one of them day in, day out, then it's a big difference, isn't it? And, th and that can throw off learners, and then they're not paying attention to the core message you're trying to get over in that session, because you've just confused them by changing all the initial terminology. That is a challenge with this one, isn't it? Because we don't own AEC. We have an agreement with Sean Keenan to run his curriculum, and we're not allowed to change the curriculum. So he runs on March. Yeah, and, and, and again, because it, this course originated from the US, a lot of it is still has a US slant, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure how you can get around that, I'm not sure how you can make a truly international course without nudging it for every single country you run it in. The World Health Organization has been trying that for decades. You, you can't, can you? Because everyone's yeah. going to have their own myopic view of this is what we do in Tanzania, yeah. and we're not going to be doing buddy transfusions. And, it, and again, it's that challenge of within lectures, well, within uh, sessions here, that can bring out really interesting discussion of differences in clinical practice guidelines or just practice. But equally, you can you can derail a conversation or you can go off on a tangent very easily because all it takes is someone saying, we don't do that in our country, we do this completely different thing, which could be just as valid, but that is valuable conversation but takes up a lot of time and takes you away from the core directed learning point of that session. Hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure how best any course should adapt internationally to to cross that hurdle. The, the college struggles with that because we don't follow just Maltese guidelines or, or, or European guidelines or US guidelines. We have students from six different continents who have vast different CPGs, clinical practice guidelines, and how do we teach a skill to that? So people come for our APIS, our Austrian Pre-Hospital Ultrasound course, and that, that's an easy one to discuss because ultrasound is ultrasound pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we're we're teaching the guidelines or, or the, the skills for austere pre-hospital ultrasound that they can hopefully take back to six continents. And actually, we have a graduate in Antarctica, so seven continents. And, and hopefully, we're not going to violate or, or teach something that goes against mm -hmm. what their, their individual CPGs are. But we can't... It can't fully align with everyone's practice. Yeah. And, and I think especially in the in the area of non-physicians, because some countries are very hard lined on you're not a doctor, so you can't diagnose with ultrasound, for mm. example. Whereas another country would say, well, are you competent to use that ultrasound? Yeah. So that's fine. Crack on. And and that's very tricky as a as an education provider. You want to give people the information, but you don't want to create a problem for them when they go and work in a different territory or region. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and that goes when when you start in the course, you, you need to 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 get get around all that by telling the people that what we are teaching here is we are not giving you license to anything. We are just teaching you the best practice and evidence based medicine, and then it's up to as long as you're not a doctor in that in that country because doctors normally have are allowed to do whatever they want. But uh, for paramedics and nurses and other people, they need to address their medical advisor in the 
uh, country or in the service they are working yeah. and have the knowledge because we also had a lot of that in in uh, Germany and other places I've been teaching that people oh I was on that course and Eric told me to do this so I can do it no you can't you have to get your yeah. approval from your yeah. and it comes to drugs because that's also a problem that uh, we are having sometimes that uh, the courses that is from the US they d use different drugs than mm -hmm. we have in Europe mm -hmm. and even in Norway so we need to have that cleared out before we start teaching what are the the things that are different from yeah. nation to nation so i think the best way to we cannot make a course that's valid all over the world with the same procedures mm -hmm. cpgs and same drugs and all that stuff but we need to l have a look at the students that we are bringing in and maybe have a talk with them before and or uh, send some emails and are you using this and this kind of drugs i don't know if that's possible to do but we at least the big pictures like the March versus the CABC, what kind of drugs, what kind of resuscitation. Yeah, yeah. Another fun fact is actually that Norway is the only country that used three minute cycles on CPR because mm. the rest of the world mm -hmm. is using two minute cycles. You do three minutes? Yeah, we do three minute cycles. And I'm asked the doctors, what's the logic or what's the research behind it? Then uh, I don't get any numbers so, or any valid information. No, we do three minute CPR cycles in Norway. It'd and be interesting to see the outcomes compared to two minutes. Yeah, uh, I I don't know. I, they, they some of the doctors said, yeah, it's better to keep hands on CPR for a longer period mm -hmm. of time. But yeah, so when I'm teaching in Malta, I have to switch my brain to two minute cycles, and when I'm teaching in Norway, I have to <laughs> switch back to three minute cycles. Well, there is definitely science showing the longer you have hands on pushing compressions, the better the outcomes. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's fascinating. I guess the the other way we address the different skill levels in the college, especially, is most of our courses have a built-in phone for top cover medical advice, and I think we've normalised that on our courses. Of is now a good time to phone for advice? Is now a good time to phone for advice or input? And and that might be specific, like I would like to give some ketamine, can I? Or it could be I'm up to this point in patient care. And I think that's valuable when you're running a course because if your candidate doesn't need that in their own practice, it's still good practice to remind them to phone a friend. But if they're going back to a system where they are less independent in their practice, we are training as we fight and we're training them to look out for those opportunities to gain top cover and support. So I think as a college, that's how we've addressed that mm -hmm. issue because even if you're a, an independent practitioner, so, so I'm a physician in my country, um, but I still have top cover and I can phone another doctor for advice on complex cases. So I think embedding that in a course normalizes that culture and hopefully makes it more internationally accessible for, for people whose scope of practice is more limited. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what I've been learning. I've been working in, in Norway as a, as a paramedic for over 30 years. And at the beginning, when I was a young paramedic, I wouldn't call anybody because I know everything. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. need help. <laughs> So uh, during the years, I learned better, of course. But the thing is that when I started two, three years ago as a paramedic for the community doctor, I found out they are also always calling if they are in doubt or anything they want to discuss. They're calling the surgeon in the hospital or the mm. cardiologist mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. hospital, not necessarily because they are unsecure, but they, they want to have a second opinion. Yeah. So my, my point is that calling a friend, it doesn't need to be one higher than you. Always, it could be a colleague who has, and you present the case in a good way, and he will maybe come up with some yeah. other, hey, it, differential diagnosis, this could be this, or this could be that, and it will help to have somebody that, to talk to, either yeah. on your, your same level or, or, or higher. Or even higher. even lower, when I'm running yeah. scenarios in austere environments, I'll, I, when I get to a, a pause and, and stabilize, and now I'm like, what do I do now? I, I go around, so I, I, I know you have, very little me medical education. You're an EMT or or, or Lord. What do you think? Yeah, they they, yeah. they might come up with something that I've missed. So it it goes to all levels. It's just another brain to, to bounce off of, isn't it? Yeah. And and I think we specifically for this course, the austere emergency care course, we have that built into the scenarios, and it's built into the core capabilities of prolonged field care. Is what is your communication strategy? What is your backup communication strategy? So when we when we get these guys to run their long scenario. It's a key part of of the their practice, isn't it? Of of your comms and your top cover, and making a plan. So I think 
again that makes this course easily transferable to different countries hmm. because even if you're very limited in your scope and you have to phone to get it, give any drug we've sort of built that into this course from those core capabilities so right from the foundations there's what is your pathway of communications who do you phone how do you present them with a question that gives them all the information to, to offer you advice and support yeah, because this this course is basically f for people who uh, can be stuck with a patient for a longer period of time because evac is delayed. This is not like working in the ambulance service in London or in Oslo yeah. where you have everything around you for ten, uh, 10 minutes later. So you need to have a plan and that comes to planning uh, the phase of, uh, of your uh, deployment in the military or your expedition in the civilian. So you need to know where to go to, who to call, and also another important thing on that planning phase is that you need to know the nearest hospital. Do they have the capability that this patient need? Or do I need to get him to another hospital will take maybe a yeah. half an hour longer time. So planning with all the, uh, the communication systems and who to call and also planning for what if I get a patient, where do I send him? How do I get him evac? Is also a big part, in my opinion, of the plan. And again, trying to make that internationally relevant because each jurisdiction has different terminology of is it a level two or a level three center? Is it a major trauma center? It's challenging running a course like this to have a common language of saying to a candidate, where do you think you want to take this patient? And they might say, I want to take them to a level three trauma center. And I think, I don't really know what that means because that's not the terminology I use. So again, that's that's very difficult to internationalize any any course where you're running scenarios and, and getting that level of engagement. I think that's a challenge that that's always there on these courses. I think the challenge is language, and we we try to not follow any country's uh, regulations. We try to teach education that's going to be applicable to the whole world, and that is difficult because each language, each each country has their own language for a level one hospital versus yeah, a, yeah. what is a rural two was a rural two e well no yeah. one no one has the same language and it's up to the un the world health to maybe come up with a with a uh, universal language for for medicine yeah i don't think that will happen i don't think so either <laughs> they tried esperanto didn't they and that yeah, didn't work that very didn't well work so. so we're on day three of the aec and how has teaching got been going for you guys so far well, I've been mostly in the background uh, trying to organize the course, uh, putting up uh, the Sea Rescue School as a, as an entity for uh, for uh, teaching AC courses in the future. So uh, for me, I haven't been teaching so much, but I think it's uh, it's good. Most of the Norwegian speaks good English, and all the students we have here speaks understandable English. <laughs> even the uh, Scottish guy. In the, even the Scottish guy speaks uh, understandable English. So uh, from my point of view, it's been great because as you said, this is a professional sea rescue school. They have all the equipment, they have all the procedures in place. Uh, I think it would be much harder and much more planning if you had a course that was running in a cabin in the mountain or uh, yeah. you need to bring the, all the logistic around it. Mm. Here, everything is just it's where right you there. go. 10 yeah. meters and you have all your aid bags you have uh, talking about the hypothermia uh, while we were jumping the dumping the two pay, uh, students or patient into the water there are i think it's seven or eight rescue vessels around them so that wouldn't be a problem yeah. and we have divers and everything ready so yeah and i think i think here's highlighted the value of having equipment lists for any session of having clear learning outcomes clear preparation all, all the the dull stuff like audio visual checking beforehand again we're very lucky here that this is a established training uh, establishment um but even so i think there's still been occasional scrambling around for extra bits of equipment extra bits of you know additional handouts for students again focusing on creating the best learning environment for students and even though we we were well prepared for this course there's always the the odd thing that we have to sort out at the last minute and, and again it's it's much easier because we're based here and i think if you were if you wanted to run this in somewhere that didn't have a printer didn't have the internet didn't have cupboards full of medical gear um you would need to invest even more time in checking and double checking your kit lists and your handouts and and your your audio visual your tech side um 
So, so I think we've had all the usual blips that, that any course has. Yeah, yeah, I, t I totally agree. I mean, I think that uh, Henrik, who is uh, who is the assistant course coordinator, who is uh, local from the Sea Rescue School, he he has made a, a very good idea that uh, we are now uh, prepping every class with one box for the practical. Mm -hmm. So everything mm -hmm. is in that box. So if you're gonna do airway, we have everything that we need that we're gonna present and what we're gonna train on yeah. for the numbers of students that we have, and everything is ready. So you just pick that box up. Yeah, and then you go to the next box for the next uh, practical lesson instead of having a shelf where you have the BVMs on that side and then you have the cry yeah. kit on that side. You have everything in one box that considers, let's say, March algorithm. Yeah. You have everything for massive bleeding box. You have the airway box and you have the circulation box. Because I think in certainly in in various education I've done, it's it's very tempting to have your stock room with your normal shelves. Yeah. And when you're when I'm clinical, I have my kit bag and I take my kit bag into the room and I pick things off the shelf and restock the kit bag. And I think the temptation in education is to not have the kit bag. Instead, you just have your classroom and you think I'll go to the storeroom and I'll get what I need for this classroom. And what we're what we're saying really is the obvious answer that you need a kit bag, but your kit bag is a box that says tracheostomy or cricothyroidotomy teaching for up to four students. And that is your kit bag, and you restock that bag, ready for the, for your next session, hmm. uh, in the same way you would a clinical response bag or a, a resus bag. Okay. Um, and we're certainly we're getting better at that. Hmm. And at Corum, we we work we're working on that. But I think that's that's a challenge. But obviously, you need a much bigger storeroom because then you need many boxes for for every session you teach or every intervention you teach. So it's it's not a, it's not an easy win. But I think it is a powerful uh, addition to, if if you have the capability to do that. Yeah, kit management is is definitely high priority for our courses because there's so much of a hands-on element to them. I'm reminded of the time we ran courses at KCMC in Tanzania, where we had to bring everything. We couldn't rely on yeah. anything. We brought down enough to run the paramedic course and before COVID, and the challenges of that flying with seven or eight yeah. bags full of kit and going through customs and having the the guys think we're invading. <laughs> or, yeah. um, and again here we've, we've been very spoiled in that this training facility has the mannequin. So if you want a mannequin for wound packing, it will appear um, because the guys here are doing a great job. But I think if you were, if you were running it somewhere that didn't have a whole room full of various limbs and mannequins, you'd really need to decide on how to optimize your kit because you, you don't really want a wound packing mannequin and a resus mannequin and a tra polytrauma mannequin and a mannequin you can carry. Ideally, you want one mannequin that does everything, right? Hmm. But but that planning ahead again is, is challenging and tricky um, and then throws a spanner in the works of having a box that teaches every skill because if they've just been using the mannequin to rescue from, from some water, but then you want to use that mannequin for wound packing and the next station is how to put a pelvic binder on, that's going to slow down your transition between stations. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's certainly a, a challenge when running a course that covers so many elements. Indeed. So what advice would the two of you have to anyone who is preparing to teach a high-end medical course in an area they're not familiar with? Equipment and legislation. Yeah, I think, as we mentioned before, local knowledge, local guide, that, as, that's always the answer. And I think specifically for, well, for this course, but more generalizable, we, this course is a basic and an advanced course combined. And I think it would be easy to shy away from that and think, oh, that's too much challenge, that's quite challenging, that's difficult. But I think everyone gains quite a lot from that mix of candidates and I don't think we should shy away from from embracing that as interprofessional learning and and recognizing that that brings more strength to the course because everyone then has different learning needs and and they can all get something from that course I think don't shy away from having a, a mixed audience of, of candidates or participants on your course I, I actually think that uh, having that mix will make the course even better because the learning outcome will be much better because you you will then also see that the advanced people or the or, or the doctors 
they can teach skills to the basic but also the basics or uh, the fire brigade people who hasn't any mm -hmm. medical knowledge they will gain a lot of knowledge from uh, from uh, the more advanced people yeah. and mi splitting them in skill stations might be a, a yeah. good idea yeah. so because they will be overwhelmed uh, the the basic course will be overwhelmed maybe to do uh, to do a blood transfusion or a, a, or a crack but yeah. they will then combined on the exercise and you split the teams up so you have a mix of basic and advanced yeah. for example I'm referring to this course of course but I think the learning outcome will be much better for the for the students yeah I'm thinking of the TTMS course which is one of the most enjoyable to teach it, it is mixed and and we have uh, consultant doctors from all over the world coming in working side by side with a remote EMT and I'm seeing the learning going both directions where yeah. this oncologist who's about ready to go on expedition he's freaking out a bit because he doesn't know any of these hands-on skills he's looking at the remote EMT who is teaching him the trauma patient assessment that this doc has never seen before mm -hmm. in his life mm -hmm. so it goes in both directions and that's one of the benefits I believe that the college has to bring forward yeah yeah. Anything else, lads? Good to be back and good to have you back. Yeah, always nice to be in Norway. Yeah. It's my third trip to Norway this year. Yeah, surprisingly warm this time. Yeah, and, and that's the point of the hypothermia lesson. The water isn't cold. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah, just 10 degrees or something like that. that that's, that's warm in Norway. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fair Looking enough. forward to the next one in winter. In Malta. No, in, in Norway. Oh, yeah, fair one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, lads, for, for your time and discussion on, on running educational programs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine. If you would like to earn CPD credits for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CPD credit, free access for a virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on our college website at quorum.edu.mt.